What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to The Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell with the Jay Campbell podcast. It's very weird for me to continue to say that since I switched over from TOT Revolution. I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual studio by a very, very good, close personal friend of mine, uh, a man who is amazingly accomplished in his realm. It is Gunther Sonnenfeld. Gunther, how are you, brother? Good, how are you, my man? It's, it's so good to have you here. So you guys, let me give you his bio real quick. And again, like I said, like, you know, this is kind of a special podcast for me today because Gunther and I talk every day since we met like five years ago, we've just been very like-minded. He's very advanced in his awareness of earth and really outside of earth too. So it's like, this is going to be a next level podcast. But anyway, this is his bio. He's literally done groundbreaking. So he's been involved in so many groundbreaking social and ecological uh, impact ventures that have actually done over $2.5 billion in transactions, 25 plus years of diverse business and nonprofit experience. He's a dork that does code and algo development during the web 1.0 era. He began working with encryption 17 years ago. I mean, honestly, guys, this guy's intellect is off the charts. Um, he's been studying economics for 15 years. He's an interdisciplinarian. He literally does. I know this love solving highly complex, wicked problems. And um, he's, I mean, again, I could go on and on and on about how amazing he is, but the reason that he's on the show today is because he's also extremely advanced in his consciousness. His vibration is off the charts and you guys are all going to see that um, as we get through into this discussion. But, you know, as I always do on this podcast, brother, how did Gunther and Jay get to talking to each other today? Gosh, that's a really good question. If I recall, and I might have the timeline screwed up. Um, I had somehow found uh, the Shane Bales' blog, The Ruiner. Yeah. yeah. And I, had, I think you and I had a mutual friend in San Francisco. Yeah, Austin. And I sent him Austin. In, in Austin. And I sent it to him initially, and initially his head exploded. And was actually <laughs> kind of angry, upset with me for sending it, and I realized that that was probably premature. I shouldn't have done that. Because he's like, what do you mean? This, is, this isn't real, you know. And <laughs> But then, he, but then he, he calmed down and then said, you got to talk to Jay. I said, okay, great. And I think I sent it to you and that sort of kick-started everything. I remember our first conversation, dude, and it was like, you know, two birds of a feather. And it was just like, you know this too? Holy sh- Whoa, whoa. And it's like, it was like, you know, electro, electro, electrical shocks between our brains over the phone. I remember that. It was, it was a long time ago, dude. That was back in literally 2015. Or no, it's well, in internet years, that's like centuries or eons, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, literally. Yeah, very true. The um, that blog in particular uh, was really revelatory for me because it really sort of clarified a lot of things that I actually experienced in my own life, um, <clears throat> being indirectly involved in some of the programs and all that yeah crazy stuff, and uh, and then to hear it. <coughs> Excuse me. written so well and processed and, and summarized so well and <coughs> and he wrote it with mythos he wrote it as a mythology which was really clever because it was he, basically that was a way to say well it reads like myth if you don't believe it then you don't believe it but right right the, the truth he was commissioned to write it that way yeah right <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> yeah it's funny, um, you're talking about Shane Bales. Um, you know, many of the people that we watch in this podcast when it comes out know who Shane is. You and I are both friends with Shane. I've actually been speaking with Shane as of this morning, um, and he does want to come on the podcast. So that is, uh, I'll be doing that in the future, another conversation for another day. You and I will probably come up with the questions we want to ask him. Um, but before we go into the points again, just real quick, um, Tell people a little bit about like what you've done, dude, in your life, you know, just give, to give people kind of a breath of understanding of the different, you know, businesses and, and mergers and financial things that you've done because it's pretty illustrious. Yeah. Without, without being rich. So it's uh, which is also quite amazing, <laughs> but 
but uh well you've been rich and you know as of I, yeah. as, as of I, I you know yeah. you know how it works dude i know how it works uh no look the it, it's been an unortho, an unorthodox path which um has been great i wouldn't rewrite the script. <laughs> uh, basically i i started going to work for the broadcast networks when i got out of school and i was a writer producer there and i was you know embedded well within the the similar as Baudrillard would like to say at the, at the broadcast network, uh, you know, creating fakery and 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 pushing it at, for the, out to the masses. I got really good at that for a little while, and then the web web 1.0 era hit, and I got involved in a bunch of uh, startups. We actually had one called Homemade Entertainment, which was YouTube before YouTube. This was like pre broadband, and uh, anyway, you know, just a number of things in and around media and technology that were interesting. And, and then uh, the 1.0 wave blew up. Um, I, you know, had a, a couple of big corporate jobs. And then in between corporate gigs, I would go and do startups or just do project work and just ended up doing a lot of different things in the environmental space, in the social innovation space. Um, I really started to hone my skills in uh, technology development, programming, algorithmic development. And then I studied economics. I, I basically just was interested in doing a lot of things that I felt were interrelated, even though at the time I didn't know why. Um, and so that, in a, in a nutshell, so, so cut to today, if you just take all of that sort of diverse experience, um, basically our group uh, designs and builds uh, alternative infrastructure uh, that, you know, for environmental assets, that's financial assets, basically anything involving, um, you know, a different infrastructure for, uh, you know, economics. Well, let me, let me let me just cut to the chase on that because this yeah. this crowd yeah. that will be watching this show is 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 of a higher level than the the bourgeois. Yeah. <clears throat> so what you're basically saying is that you will be instrumental, and I am obviously very highly supportive of this of building the new earth. <clears throat> well, I, I wouldn't. I don't say that, but I, I I. Okay, I'll say it for you. How's that? Okay, thank you. There you go. Uh, well, look, we consider ourselves a part of that, and and um, it's a very a, a high responsibility position. Yeah, that requires a lot of humility and clarity and stuff. And so, yeah, we're we're, we're building pieces of it for sure. Um, and it's all part of a board game. It's a wild board game. Okay, so you know, I told you I was going to read this too. So, okay. so, um, so by the way, everyone, Gunther pushed me to read this book and I'm familiar with the guy who has this information quote unquote channeled to him, but it's called handbook for the new paradigm. I'll link to it in this podcast for anyone who's an advanced conscious being on this planet in this reality of now, which there's only now um, should read it. But there's this, this, I mean, again, it's, it's profound. The level of profound insight in here is, I mean, as he can share is it's second to none, but, what he's doing, Gunther and, you know, his team and the people that he's involved with, and obviously I'm involved um, in, in indirectly in the things I'm doing, but, you know, this is a quote from the book. This is for visionary realists that may never actually observe the extent of the work they do now until the very end. These people will be able to look beyond the chaos and recognize the opportunity. I suppose you might say these are people with one foot in each world who can look into both without losing their balance. So what I'm saying in reading that quote to the audience so that they can understand, I'll let you give it a better explanation, is that the entire world that you exist in right now is an illusion, okay? And when you reach a level of awareness without fear in your existence, knowing that you will never die because your soul is infinite, your energy, whatever you want to rephrase it to, then you will recognize that what is going on around you is not what it seems. So it's a choice, a personal accountable choice to recognize the things that me and Gunther live in a day-to-day -day existence, which most people don't. I would say probably less than 10% of humanity right now understands what we're talking about. But this book, you know, does a really good job of elaborating it and elucidating it. But again, you have to be brave enough to read it, okay? Because most people will read this and throw this away and say, what does this guy talk about? Because they're asleep. And again, being asleep is a choice. But as Gunther knows, the time for being asleep is past. Okay. We are now in 2020. This is this podcast is broadcasting, I think, what is today, February 12th, February 13th. And when it runs, which will be probably sometime in March, the world is changing, guys, guys and gals. The world is changing. And if you choose to change with it, that's on you. If you don't, well, 
you know, what happens is what happens. But, you know, this podcast here, we're going to jump into the topics. I'm going to let you have a statement here in a second. But this podcast today is for the new earth. This is every point that we talk about is about building a better world, not tomorrow, starting now. And again, as Gunther has told me many times, it starts with you and your focused intent. What are you doing today that you did not do yesterday or have never even thought about doing in the future that can change the world for the better? Your thoughts? Yeah, um, well, there's a few associated with that statement. I mean, I, I, I think, I suppose we can start with the, the notion of what is real. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the fact that there's 7.6, billion plus of us um, six months i think there's only going to be five in china based on what happens in china (laughs) yes they may put down so maybe down to five but currently 7.6 billion of us um you know interpreting reality in our own ways yes um you're looking at 7.6 billion nuanced interpretations of reality so what is reality and it's not so much that everything is is an illusion it's just that if we look at the reality that most of us engage in as an illusion, uh, and, and more specifically, an idea. We're engaged with an idea uh, that you know doesn't really ground itself in, in in the physical outcomes that we experience. So what we experience and what we're told run in conflict with each other inherently. And so you could call that the 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 inorganic hologram and the organic hologram, right. whatever you want to call it, right? right. But but we have a reality and we either have the choice to, to shape it and mold it and co-create within it, or we allow the prescriptions about it to guide our experiences of reality. And that's right. basically the dualism that we experience in everyday life. The, the main challenge, <clears throat> and, and this sort of goes back to the central point, is that we're, we're at a very interesting um, we're at, a, we're at a very interesting point in the, in the timeline, if you will, a uh, very existential point where now we've been circling around so much in ideas and expecting different um, outcomes to emerge that haven't. And in fact, they've degraded on account of our participation in this, in this illusory reality that now we're faced with the very real prospect of having to literally physically change what we do and what we commit to on a daily basis. So case in point, to be clear about it, um, we may not be able to go to the same job that pays us six figures and you know, have an impact in the world. We may, not, we may have to make huge sacrifices even though we have three or four kids and 3.5 cars and a, and a, and a you know, big fancy garage with cars in it. Um, we may have to um, make basically very huge sacrifices like some of us have to do the things that we know are, are right, true, good, and beautiful in the world. And that's a big choice because the world we live in right now, most people um, basically whine and complain about, you know, the government or this, that. It's not my fault, Gunther. Not my fault. They externalize all responsibility to their own lives. And that's entirely the, the trap that, we, that we've been in. So you, you, you got to make a choice. It's like, are you going to make very hard difficult choices, sacrifices for, 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 you know, with the intention of inducing better outcomes, or are you going to think that you, you can just continue to plot along in your jobs and punch clock, you know, time clocks and, and all that stuff and expect a different reality, which we both know is not, it's not really possible. Yeah. And that's what, that's, that's where we're at. Hey, that's awesome. no, it's okay. It's all, all good, man. I'm glad your dog. The bird dog. If, let, yeah. let, if you want to grab your dog and bring him into the energy, it'll, it'll, it'll elevate the energy of our podcast. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Ben. Come on, buddy. I just grab him. What are you doing, buddy? Come on. We're having a podcast. <laughs> yeah, let him jump into your uh, arms. Let okay, so, so with that point, <clears throat> so with that point, it goes perfectly right into our first point. And I'll set you up. And again, Gunther and I can talk guys forever. So I I am attempting to make this um, obviously cogent, but also, um, you know, attainable so that most people can understand it and not just understand it, but also utilize it. Right. Because both of us are about solutions. So anyway, his first point 
it's such a profound point. And I, I almost like, sometimes when I say this, I almost literally like cry because I think about my life and how this was my greatest challenge and it's self-love. And, you know, I think personally, I'm so connected from the work that I've done. And I give a lot of credit to my wife who really encouraged me, you know, seven years ago about becoming a better man and to, you know, seek within, go within to, you know, go beyond and really figure out what that my issues were a lack of love and a lack of trust of self. And I could sit here and tell everyone on this podcast that it was my dad not loving me enough and he didn't come to my games. And, you know, we can all, as you said, perfectly externalize the root, you know, ideology or causation of why we feel the same, these ways about ourselves. But <laughs> it's so profoundly true that until you love yourself and trust yourself, and again, love and trust of self does not come without work and introspection and examination and allowance and acceptance of who you really are. Um, you can't. And, and, and so I think it's such a profound statement. And I, I'll, I'll put it to you and I'll let you go and do your thing because you're going to do something amazing. I know. But it's, it's, it's dude, it's, it's the reason between, it's the reason, be, it's the difference between happiness and never reaching a state of happiness. And, and I don't want to say success. I hate using that word because as you know, there's many people out there that are very, very wealthy and have material things and, you know, have begotten whatever they wanted, but they're also down here, you know, on the vibrational scale. So it's like, is that really where you want to be? Because we both know that high vibration is ultimately the goal. So anyway, your thoughts on self-love. Yeah. So I guess a good starting place context would just be the, the, the working world right um and as you and i discussed rather it, it, it's rather humorous but I, I said to you one day i said jay you know it's funny i did all these projects for years with people and we were going to save the world and create this big change and they all blew up and i started to unpack the the, the that outcome or those set of outcomes I really wanted to understand why this was happening. Apart from whatever I was doing, I had to take responsibility for my role in it as sure. well. Maybe I was too demanding, maybe I was too controlling, commandeering, whatever. I'm, I'm sure I was. Um, and by uh, the way, by, by the way, we both are. Right. <laughs> very, very, very few people can work with people like you and I because we do demand yeah. you know, high levels of commitment. I, I mean, I don't want to interrupt you, but it's important for you to understand that we are very similar beings on that wavelength and that we're our intensity. That way. There's nothing wrong with it. I just, you exactly. just have to learn how to hone it differently, which I've, which I've had to work. It's one of the things, many things that I've but, but, but to your point, and this is important, and, and for people to listen to, this is very important. You are right, but it also makes people like you and I not liked by the majority. And that's, that's okay, too. You have to be okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's not. It's not that you're not liked. That we're not liked. It's. I think it's more of um, we're feared, and that's also not necessarily a bad thing, um, because you you want you you demand the best out of everybody right. and everything that you're doing. Right. I mean, and most people, by the way, are not wanting to give their best because again, that's, they choose. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's there's that whole aspect of it. Um, but then I was really trying to figure out, for example, why people in environmental spaces or social innovation spaces were so flaky and, and non-committal and, you know, all that. And I, I realized over time that they, they sort of embodied a certain uh, sort of uh, cohort or archetype of a, of a, a behavioral archetype of a person right. Right. who often, not always, but often is or was broken and had very dysfunctional personal relationships um had suffered typically suffered quite a lot of trauma in their yeah. youth and were drawn to these domains for reparation and salvation and all these other things which are totally fine without though the caveat being without doing the internal work and and i say that with no judgment um, again, because we've all had to do it. Yeah. We will always do internal work. Yeah. I'm saying that these traumas were not only pronounced, but it, it's kind of the behavior that you see in the liberal progressive mindset now, which yes. is, yes. I'm a victim. It, it, it was basically victim conscious behavior, essentially. Exactly. And this has which, been which, by the way, now, as you just said, literally has been blasted into the universe 
like a homing beacon for again, 80% probably, and maybe, and you said it's higher of the population of the world to be in that vibratory field right now. Totally. So what, so that being said, I would see a lot of self-destructive behaviors, right. um, coercive behaviors, um, manipulative behaviors, sabotaging behaviors, whatever psychological self sabotage, right? Right. What, what you know, all that stuff going on, and, and and it happened time and time again. So I had to learn the hard way, being in these situations, and and also being on the on the receiving end of some pretty vicious behavior, um, really bad behavior, and and that was disconcerting. And so at the time, I would kind of buck up and, and be like, fuck you, I'll, you right. know, fuck you. Right. Uh, <laughs> literally. Right, yeah. And, and obviously, that's not the way to handle it, but that's how you feel. But this also ladders back to other oh, gardeners here. Oh, my God. Hey, Benny, don't go crazy, buddy. Um, it's funny. Yeah, uh, it's, all good. it's all good. So the other part of this was i experienced this at home with my father so my father as you know is a holocaust survivor he's 87 years old and he's a wonderful man he's done great things as a physician and given of himself but his big hang up always and th and this is a point of departure for me with him in terms of our relationship he's a victim and and the worst kind of victim consciousness i've ever seen now i I, I, I have to be ginger when I say that as well, because obviously I didn't go through the experience that he went through right. having left Germany in 1938 and mm -hmm. gone, going to uh, Mao's China right. via the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So this, these were <laughs> heavy experiences as these sort of things go. Right. But the, the point being is he never really got out of victim consciousness yeah. at all. Yeah. And in fact, it, it, really sort of progressed inside of his being right, right. Uh, over the years and sure enough, sabotaged relationships, made it very difficult for us to have a relationship with him. Yeah. Even though he was great with his patients, not so good with his family, kind of like yours, of of yours, right? So seeing that firsthand, I thought, gosh, you know, self-love, self-responsibility interlinked. And, there, and, and, if you, and if you apply this to the the sort of new age leadership spaces, you don't hear this talked about, I don't see it talked about anywhere. Ever. Self-love, self-responsibility. It's the whole thing. How are you gonna build anything disruptive if you're not disrupting yourself internally? Yeah, exactly. Including dealing with all the negative emotions and the shadow stuff. You gotta take that shit head on. And it's not it's, easy. It's funny, just to go back, um, what you said about your dad, and obviously, you know, I work in the medical space in you know, many different ways. And mm -hmm. yes, that's what the medicine, the caduceus, that's what it unfortunately has now taught it literally as he was working as a profound physician, helping all these people, they were coming into his vibratory field, which was again, as you said, victim consciousness, like, you know, I say this all the time, right? Like people that are mind blown or are, are just addicted or attached to the whole sick care system you know yeah. they want to go in and they want to be sold a bill of goods that it's not their responsibility and that the pills and that the bullshit you know will yeah. fix them and so that is literally sick care in a nutshell it really is you know enshrined victimhood and yeah. supported victimhood and so yeah your dad literally vibrated in that for what 40 years of his life well, he was a physician for 52. He's 87. Jesus, so he left, well, he left Nazi Germany when he was six in 1938. In fact, in fact, Kristallnacht was on his birthday, November 9th, wow. which is even crazier. But, um, but you're, yeah, to your point, he never, he never evolved out of it. And of course he became an alcoholic and, and all the, you know, I, I don't even like saying. It's like you said, you're, once, you're, once a victim, not doing yeah. the inner work, you become right. self-destructive. That's your release. As but a, a wonderful man, though, and, and this is the interesting part about it. Uh, this is a man who went out of his way to treat people and not get paid, unlike his partners who would, you know, take, no, wouldn't even take insurance. It was only right. private. He never did any of those things. He gave of himself. So it's a, it's a remarkable sort of dichotomy where, you know, he, he's given – so much to society yeah. yet internally and inside the family no, yeah it's turned away very yeah. dysfunctional which i suppose is not an unusual story no i was about to say that's exactly what happens and then yeah. and, and again and that that's also too why why those folks are so externally praised 
because they don't actually see what you and I know. Yeah. It's amazing. And again, that's the whole world. I mean, you and I could make the whole, you know, argument of, you know, Hollywood and politicians and the archetypes of how they're shown to us and really what they are is the opposite. It's pretty yeah. scary. So that was an interesting thing too, growing up in LA and being exposed to all that stuff and, and even some of the early programs. And I mean, we don't have to go into all that yeah. Yeah. stuff now or ever really, but, yeah. um, but all of which to say that the areas where you get attacked when you come into conscious awareness are in the heart. Exactly. I've always been, in, I mean, I've had attempts on my life for different reasons, but, um, but, but the main attacks have been in my, on my heart, particularly in the last five years, major, like rip, you know, right. They go right for the heart. Right. Right. And that's, you know, because if you don't, if you're, if you're, if you're a being, if you're becoming, you're coming into being and you, and you, if you have self-love, the power within you, you have all the power you need. That's I was about it. to say, that's yeah. exactly right. You know, and, and there's a couple other points that we're going to talk to about mm -hmm. still too. Really good points, but you know, just stay there. Yes, when you become, when you love yourself, okay, which also obviously personifies trust of self. Yes, you don't give a shit what's going on around you because you're not in any fear vibration love and trust of self knows again and this is my opinion but i don't think anyone who truly loves and trusts themselves is in fear yeah because someone who's in fear is surely not in love and trusting of themselves because their energy is displaced in fear they're worried about something and again yeah. as you know majority of people as they get older worry about death yeah yeah well, well this is a good segue right so that death is a great topic because normally we think of death as finality or the end of something right. we know in the universe it's regeneration and exactly all that stuff but but the, the key part is and this is what you know what what most people don't know is there's no death there's literally no death so <laughs> and how would you know this well i i fortunately have had i call i don't even call them near-death experiences they're their death experiences yes yeah, right I've been able to go there and see the false light and all that interesting, wacky stuff. Right. But, but the point is, is if you know that there's no death, then you can start, you can really start to embrace life. Right. And all of the possibility that exactly. you can create while you're here, knowing that you can do all this stuff and then you can leave and go do it elsewhere. Exactly. Whatever you want to exactly. do. Exactly. Um, but we're not there yet. We're, we're sort of in this construct of, Oh, there, there's no afterlife and there's no God and there's no source. And it's, it's like, really? So there's a brain in the vat, you fucking yeah. morons. Really? Are we, are we, are we going to have a scientific debate about something that is completely asinine? I mean, you know, it's all that stuff that gets in the way. Um, but that's pretty much it. So there's this not, there's this knowing this, um, you, the, the embrace of everlasting life, the power within it. And then the love that's associated with it, right. and then, then you can then you can really ground in the responsibility of discovering what it is you're here to do. Now, now I say this, and I think this is important for people to understand. I didn't figure out what I was supposed to be doing here until I was about 35. Yeah. In fact, I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and I didn't know what any of it meant. 41 or for me, by the way, bro. 41 for me. Right. So 41 for you. So you know, I'm 47. You're roughly the same age. I mean, a little older than you. Yep. But this didn't happen right away at, at all. And yeah. at, at all. It never does, dude. It, it never, never does. does. But the society in society writ large, we're led to believe that, well, you got to figure out by the time you're 25 or 30, and then you got to buy a house, and then you got to get married. And then, I got to have 10 million in the bank by the time I'm 45. You got to have X amount of money in the bank. It's like, okay, how about losing everything in your bank account several times right. before right. you appreciate what the fuck money really exactly. is? Exactly. You can't, and by the way, you cannot, and again, I've said this many times before. Yeah. And I have lost it and I have been a multimillionaire and yeah. I've been pretty much zeroed out. I know. You cannot grow the soul. And you talked about the heart capacitance. Mm -hmm. Coherence does not happen until you have, again, had those dark nights of the soul where you've literally been at the fucking, the razor's edge, the blink of destruction that, you know, the, ex as you said, the, the existential knowing that you're fucking meaningless. Right. Yeah. And, and, and look, when you have meaning and purpose 
it, it, that's all that fucking matters. I mean, I can, I can, to be totally honest with you, I have the least, I'm, I'm the least liquid I've ever been in my life. And I am the most stressed. joyful. Exactly. I'm the most joyful I've ever been because I'm clear and I enjoy my life. I like hanging out with my dog. I appreciate my house. And bro, that's what matters. You go when you go out when you're out there surfing. I can and go running you. outside and no one's gonna fucking tell me what to do. You know, these simple things. I know. You know, I can smile at the neighbor. I, you know, so that's all that matters. And 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 the money comes and goes and you build, you you're gonna build and you're gonna rebuild. And you there's always a lesson in it. There's always a reason why it happens. Yeah. You know, even at the yeah. even though at the time you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but it comes around and that's it. So I, this goes back to the point we're at right now, which is, okay, <laughs> the collapse of the, you know, the financial system and the physical world and the 3D world, and then, then, and then ascension and all the notions of ascension. And what does that mean? Oh, we're going to just leave the world. And I'm like, right. really? Right. Aren't we supposed to bridge the two here? Aren't yeah. we supposed to make physical reality something else, something other than what's been prescribed or predetermined? 100%. You know? Aren't we supposed to double down on our responsibilities to ourselves and each other to do that? And not as a notional concept, no. as, as a physical, real. committed action, something that's real and tangible, yeah. you know? I don't know. Right? No, I, I'm with you. I mean, I mean, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about building the new earth and obviously we both aspire and ascribe to the same thing. You know, the, the aliens are not coming down in their motherships. <laughs> Okay, it's well, not going to well, happen. I had, a, I had a visit over the summer. They're coming down, but only to select people. That's, well, you know what I'm saying. Oh, my God. But, but, the, but, but the reality is, dude, is this, right? Like, yeah. I hate, I mean, you already did simplify it, but it's <laughs> literally moving your essence, your sense of being to being here where you're in the four to 500, you know, you're not going to really get into 600 unless you're on MDMA or ketamine, but... <laughs> Or, or, or uh, I, you know, ayahuasca, if you're- Are you uh, handing those down, by the way? Is that kind of <laughs> if you're of a high vibration, uh, that's a whole nother conversation for not, okay. not, not right now. But, but, but truthfully, um, if you resonate in the 400 to 500 range and you live there and you control your states through your actions, you know, you're kind, concerned, caring, compassionate. Yeah. If you do those things, you are- a part of the new earth, right? Because we yeah. both understand that the new earth is not going to be of a low vibration. The low vibrating beings and you know inanimate objects, because as you know, everything has life, everything's conscious, everything's sentient. That's not going to exist. Here's a really here's a really good example of what you're describing. It's very simple and, and actually quite funny. And I've been experiencing this more and more. There, I will, I will be literally at a venue, let's say down the street at my local restaurant bar, which I love to go to. And there will have been people there. There are people that will show up that I've had past experiences with that are, let's say, unsavory, is for lack of a better word, or people that are just low vibration people for different reasons, no judgment. They literally don't see you. Exactly. You are invisible. You become invisible. Absolutely true. You're not even because you're not even in the same energy field. Right. It's a law of resonance. Yeah. And you're not even there. You're not even there. It's really funny. It's really interesting. You can even try to speak to someone uh, of that disposition, and they won't hear you. They literally won't hear you. It's, it's by the way, that is that is such a profound uh, awareness. And, and let me actually take it one step further. In video, right, like you and I doing this, mm -hmm. doing a podcast or whatever, if one of those low vibratory beings observes us, we literally are driving them nuts because it, exactly as you said, like their field is not jiving with our field. And there is, again, that whole like, it's dissonance, right? From our resonance, they're dissonant to our resonance. So you're right. So they won't see you in physical around, but like if they're watching this, you're literally, th this message will drive a low vibration person insane. Now, what's interesting about all this, yeah, in, in terms of auric fields and um, spectral fields and all, and let's just call it energy, right? What the, the, the easiest way I can describe what's going on right now in this transition is there's a bunch of displaced energy right. and it doesn't know where to go. And a lot of it is, not just necessarily dark energy or negative energy, but neutral energy, yeah. 
confused energy, just right. energy that you don't necessarily, that's not yours. Right. And, and whereby you don't have, you don't need to be a vessel or a conduit for right. it. Right. So I say this because it's really important to be aware of that and to ground in your own essence and your own, in your own energy and, and be very careful with it, uh, using it, wielding it, um, allowing people to draw from it, protecting it, whatever it is, you, you have to be hyper aware of that um, because of what's going on. Yeah. It's nuts. And you see it. You literally see it. And it's not just people in venues. You see it on the road. Um, I mean, you'll, you'll observe people driving and it's almost like they're in a pinball machine floating right. Right. and there's no being there. Right. They're just operating heavy machinery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really strange. Well, that, that, that's the, exactly. And we've talked about this before, but that's the thing is like you and I and people of our vibration and like us. And again, as you say, I love it. Is that no judgment? And, and, and of course there's never judgment. You don't, you don't do the work that you and I have done and judge people. Yes. We get mad. Yes. We get emotional. Sometimes our ego reacts, yeah. but our ego is keeping us here. Yeah. Right. And it has a place, but um, it, it, it is true. You know, and again, there, you can't get into the focus of this, but the thought process, it just crossed my mind. You t saying that is like, you know, and you said at the beginning of the show, there's 7 billion people here. I mean, are there really, you know what I'm saying? Like how many higher, you know, higher evolved beings or souls? Well, no, no, no. But I mean, like realistically, we, we're told those numbers and then we resonate that collective human super central computer vibration of like, this is what we're told. So this is what we have to believe. But you and I know that there are a lot of beings out there that are probably not with soul. And again, are they humans? Oh, are they sure. whips? Are they for bots? Sure. Are, what are they? Man, I, um, it's really, I mean, I've dealt with a lot of yeah. people without souls. Yeah. Um, obviously, beings and entities, plenty of that stuff. But it is, it, to your point, it's now you're seeing people, if you want to call them that, yeah. Yeah. who have operating systems but no souls right exactly i blips don't know in the, blips in the matrix dude bots blips. i mean they're just the yeah. lowest canon called them backfill people you can call them automatons you can call yeah. them cyborgs you can yeah. call them anthropogenic cyborgs right. whatever right. um but whoever you're dealing with is not a person basically right, right. And, 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 and and by the way as a human being if you place any energy into human yeah. relating to those beings you are going right. down a tunnel going down, you will not down, come down. out of okay. Okay. Yeah. You as are. you and i have found out we have debated them and it's like a lost cause i mean you you, you and, and again it's almost like it's purposeful in okay, this here's the good news here's the good news in all of this if, if as you become aware and you, you learn how to deal with these situations demons are not scary to deal with right entities are not scary to deal with aliens are startling but they can't they can't really mess with you according to universal laws. You, you don't have to fear any of those interactions. Right. What you do have to be fearful of or aware of is how your energy is being used. Exactly. Super, right? right. Because the reality is, is when you're vibrating at a higher level. They can't touch you. Well, not, not just, that's right. And that's exactly right. I mean, in a nutshell, that's the truth. So you, you don't have to fear those things, but, but it's, a, it's a constant barrage yes. of stuff. stuff of signaling, of advancement, of them coming at well, whatever. Well, it's like you and I have said this to each other a million times. You and I can do all the inner work we want. We can meditate. Yeah. We can connect with nature, go out, have the trees drop their you know, fluid and their essence all over us and be in the most amazing space ever and then literally get in our car and drive to work and some guy literally attempt to kill us. <laughs> yeah. That will <laughs> That's living in the earth plane. Yeah. And the master... And again, not everyone's a master and even being or wanting to be a master is not for everyone either. So, I mean, we say that again without judgment, but a master is able to recognize that that is going to happen and still control his reaction to not be, motherfucker, I'm going to kill you. And, and, and to adapt. So, and, and this goes into training, but what I mean by adapting is, okay, if there's these energy shifts and right. the disposition of beings and energies are constantly shifting, right. that means you have to adapt the way that you train to exactly. be in the world as All it is. Practice. All Here's practice. Here's an example, right? So I stopped doing sitting meditations a long time ago 
for lots of different reasons. I'm wired differently. Sure. So I like to fire up the neurons in, or to fire up my nervous system. Neuro, neurophysiology. Motion creates emotion. The motion creates, yeah. So for me, it's the I Ching stuff, the standing meditation, it's the fighting motion, it's the movement of yeah, energy, of and that stuff that for me is meditation because then I get into harmonic resonance. Right. I create a guard around me and, the, and the, all that stuff. Bro, right? we're the exact same. I literally can meditate and I don't even hate, I hate using that word. I, I can contemplate deeply by, when I'm on my bike. When you're on your bike because you're in motion. You're actually at a point of stasis, zero point stasis. Totally zero point. By, by matching the motion of all the energy around you exactly. or exceeding. That's the exactly. best way I can explain it. That's not a very scientific explanation. No, that's actually a really good explanation. <laughs> no, but that's a very good explanation. So, so I do the same thing, okay? And that seems to be very effective. But there's always an adaptation or an improvement. I have to change. So this is the difference between discipline and routine. Most people have a routine. Like, they'll get up, you know, they go to the bathroom, they make the bed, they make some coffee, that's fine, cool. But discipline is actually the ability to adapt and refine routine right. In, right. to support the background practice of evolving your place in the world, yes. right? And I'm talking about physical, mental, and, and corporeal training, uh, yes. spiritual training, all, yes. all of those things, right? And it's very important in being able to deal with the world the way it is. Mm -hmm. I, if we didn't do those things, I don't know what the hell I would do. I mean, you know. <laughs> it's absolutely true. But I mean, but think of the people who do none of those things. That's just I, I know. the majority. And I don't understand how you can do that. I, I don't. Because, bro, okay, so I'll, and again, no judgment, but this is just my separa separation statement is that yeah. they don't mm -hmm. know any better. Wow. They're literally living on default. When you don't choose to wake up, life is default. I don't know if people don't know any better. I used to think that for a long time. I'm not sure that's really the, the truth. I think people intuitively know a lot more than they take themselves for. Well, we all know everything, right? We just well, chose to forget. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think it's, I think it's deeper than that. I think it's what you said earlier, where there's, there is a deep reluctance to want to do the change that's inevitable or to, to embrace work, to, to work, to work, to work, to put the work in. Put the work in. That's it. I really believe it's that. I think but maybe, but do you think though that the, 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 the reluctance to put the work in is more of a new um, construct, a newer, you know, meaning like in the last 20 to 30 years because of technology replacing so much, do you think it's a more of a newer age type thing than it was say, say 75 to hundred years ago? Oh, do you I think, think all I people think, are all lazy by, by, by I think it was always a challenge. I mean, look, if we go back to Atlantean times right. or, or Mesopotamia or, the Babylon, you know, any of those, those demiurgic periods, actually the technology enhancements were far greater in terms of ripple met meta yeah, effect, probably. effect in the universe. Probably. So if anything, the, the reductions that we have now are far, they're not nowhere near the scale um, of that. And, and with social media and virtual technologies and all that stuff, that's just an extension of our biogenetic de-evolution, if you will. Right. right? Totally. It's, totally. Just, it's just another container for that that thing that's going on um, it's a public it's a public it's a public personification of victimhood that's part of it absolutely and it's also flat media it's it's interesting i was trying to frame this for a friend the other day he's like well how would you describe linkedin now and i and i thought about it for a second and i said well it's a flat media container and you think that you're involved in a network that's alive with people but oh. really what you're what you're doing is you're given your own personal container with avatars and you interact with the avatars. Right. You're not interacting with the people right. because most right. of the people that have the avatars are spinning out programs that you're interacting with. That's basically what's going on. So he's like, wow, oh, maybe I should go off LinkedIn. And I said, well, no, you can stay on there for a while, a little while longer, but that's kind of what's happening. You know, I, you know, I, I, and, I can and, make an argument. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, I can make an argument that all of our lives would improve instantaneously <clears throat> if we killed our social media. But then I could also say that, you know, as an entrepreneur with multiple streams of income that I do rely, you know, sure. on the ex, you know, exposure 
of my brand but and that's my okay. products. You're, but that's okay. That's a network effect. No, this but is, I'm just saying, I, I'm in agreement with you 100%, yeah. but it's like we have self-enslaved ourselves. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's more like the simulacra that the the Badrio talks about right. and, and other people, but the phenomenology of of objects, right? Yes. You're interacting yes. with objects and idea, you know, and 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 thought forms, but yes. but not people, you know. Yes. Yeah, I mean, look, I I'll, I'll admit in the earlier in my career, you know, the early social stuff was fascinating because in those days you would have very evolved, somewhat structured conversations with totally, people who were totally. sharing ideas and you would make connections that totally, way. I mean, totally. I got invited to speak all over the world at that time because of my ideas. So there was a lot of merit to it. Then of course, everybody f flooded in. There was too much signal noise. And now you're just you know trying to shout through a megaphone. And well, that, that's what's so scary, dude, is that people, yeah. are, people today really don't know who, unless, hey. you know, it's okay. Unless, unless, unless you're, you're in an inner circle of people like us, you, yeah. you don't really know who are the true experts. Most of the stuff that you find online, exactly as you said, is literally hogwash. Yeah. So that's an interesting point. And, and the way we, we don't even look at it as expertise anymore. We look at it as um, who are the progenitors, right. who are the collators, and who are the synthesizers of information. <laughs> And and then you you can and then you can kind of map them. So for example, I'm I'm a technology guy. Totally so, true, dude. But my feeds are all set up that I've personally set them up where I look at the source of the information and their relationship to the information in a network. It's not a black and white thing. And then I can it helps me discern what information's worth looking at because I I I have to do research every day, right? Okay, I so so okay, so that's a really good point, and I want to stop you. No one has ever brought that up on the show. That's phenomenal. That's fucking so world class, dude. See, you and I, you talk about progenitors. You and I have done the work. We're also almost fifty. We've yeah. been involved in technology. We've been involved in you know the growth of the internet. Yeah. And, and really the information expansion. Yeah. We know what, you know, again, you said it, you just triggered me so hard, but we know, <laughs> we know the progenitors. We actually know when the information is coming from one specific or a different, you know, person, we instantly yeah. know if those people know what the fuck they're talking about. And unfortunately today, Gunther, the younger people of today who have don't who lack discernment, who grown up in the technology space of the instant gratification internet, they don't have the ability to discern. A, they haven't done the work. B, they're not old enough. And C, as you said, the signal to noise ratio is out of fucking control. How would they know? Yeah. So, th so if we go back to discernment, there's two. So there's two aspects of this. Right? Jesus, One man. is what and and it's simple way I would I would say this to a younger person or someone who wants to uh, understand how to curate differently or research differently and we've done this in workshops in the past is what is the sensation that you are experiencing in your body exactly when you are encountering the information exactly. right exactly. And, and then I say I don't exactly. I don't care what you think. I don't want to know what you think I don't care about what you think it means nothing. I want I want to know what you're sensing then as we unpack right. the sensation of right. what you're experiencing, then I want to know what you see. Exactly. And they'll, and they'll say, well, I think, I'll say, no, 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 shelve it. Don't care about what you think. What do you see now that you're sensing the information? Right. right. This is what I mean by neurophysiology. It, absolutely, dude. Right? And, and, and by the way, and I said this, this is profound stuff. I said this in the group before you were in the group. Mm -hmm. And Martin Gettys posted it on Twitter, but I said it takes a pure heart, a pure heart to discern real truth. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying. So if you can literally teach a person, how do you feel? What does your heart tell you as you're portraying or reading or coming across the information? You're right. You will know because the soul will tell you. Now, of course, and I know you know this distinction, not feel, not emotional feelings. Exactly. Sensations in the body. Yes. Very, very different thing. Because, because to your point, what, what's happening now also is we are becoming highly reactive right. emotionally. Right, 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 right. I'm glad you clarified without, that. Yes. Without even knowing what we're reacting to. Right. Right. That's a that's a whole other information. Problem. Right. Now, in terms of finding things out, right, and this is where investigative work 
comes into play, uh, having worked a little bit in intelligence comes into play. If I don't know something, which is a lot of, of happens a lot <laughs> yeah. all the time, I figure out who I need to talk to and I go, I go contact them directly. And, you know, it's a little bit, this is definitely the case as you get older because the world gets smaller. Yeah, of course. I would say anybody that you want to talk to, I don't care who they are, is one phone call away. Yeah, if exactly. you know how to, exactly. you know how to reach them, and if you know how to frame the question, people will tell you anything you want to know if you frame the question properly. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, very well said. And unfortunately, and again, as you know, is that the younger people of today, to no fault of theirs, have been detached and detuned from you interaction so they yeah. don't know how to phrase the yeah. question or well, even they don't know how to have conversations and i would argue that we don't know how to have conversations in our generation because everything's dialect everything's an argument so you have cartesian argumentation which is basically well i think and i have an argument what why is everything a fucking argument what are we arguing about like we don't even know what we're arguing about. It's, it's, a, it's a name right then you have the, Achille, the euclidean approach which is basically like you say something like well i see this yeah. And I'll say something, I see that based on experience. We can compare notes based on the experiences, not the interpretation of right. what we think is going right. on, right. but what is actually going on. And then the tension points reveal insight. A really simple example. If you and I were to sit on a beachhead and look at the, at the, at the, at the seascape and, and someone said, describe it, you could say, I see this, and I'll say, I see that. We're going to see two different things. Then we compare notes. No one is going to see the exact same thing. And, it, and it, this is not about providing definitions. If you say, well, what is a car? Obviously, we'll give the same definitions. But if we, if we describe where, what, what the car is doing and where it's going, we're going to have different interpretations. Right. That's a very rudimentary way of saying, okay, what do I see? So I see language is very powerful. I think, I feel, I hope, I wish. These are all externalizations exactly. used in language to separate you, distance you from potential truth. And that's what, that's what happens. You mean dream boards aren't effective, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> don't even get me going. I always say every year when, you know, because Monica likes to do that for our real estate team, I'm like, I, I don't partake in those because I have action boards. Right, yeah. I have, I, have, I have conscious action boards. I mean, but I mean, you're right, dude. And, and, and again, the trappings of modernization. I mean, we could go, it's a whole nother path. Okay, this podcast okay. has been profound. Let's do the last 10 minutes. Okay. Solutions. Okay, you talked about providence. You talked about commercial and civic participation, embodiment and transcendence. All three of those we can wrap up in 10 minutes. But again, it's, it's taking action. It's like what you, you know, we, we talk about all the time. It's again, intent focused conscious intent what yeah, so are they're going to do <clears throat> yeah so we don't have to necessarily acknowledge that there there's no real acknowledgement of what is really going on because what is really going on is relative okay right. so we don't have to steep ourselves in that whole investigation what we do need to acknowledge is that something that things are not as good as they could be. That's a and best way to say it. Instead of looking at like this, and this is, this is a very easy way to understand the Hegelian dialectic, but instead of look, looking at it as, as you know, um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, it would be this, that, and other. So right. to get to other, we, we're going to recognize <coughs> this bullshit going on and that bullshit going on, and other would be neither of the two. Right. And in order to do that, now what we have to individually commit to is, okay, do I love myself enough to want to do something greater than myself? If that's the case, and I am willing to become self-responsible, what am I willing to do to train into that self-responsibility and discover what it is I really want to do in the world? And it doesn't have to be this huge, grandiose thing. It, it, it can be anything. But it's something that you actively commit to and you stick to your commitments. And, and, and I always say this, there's the three hardest things for people to do and they're the most simplest and it separates you know, the doers from the non-doers is um, uh, setting an intention, having a vision and committing to it. And most people can't do it. Right. But if, if you can do it, um, 
you you're gonna you're gonna create something amazing and magical, and there'll be a ripple effect in the world. And that's all we have to do. We don't have to look at this like we're gonna say there's no saving of the world. There's no saving of the world. No one's gonna come and save us. That's all bullshit. What what all the stuff is is internal. So if if you can frame it that way. And you say, I'm gonna do so I'm gonna do something other than what I'm seeing over here. Because I'm seeing these things right. and I recognize them. And this is what I'm good at, or what I have a proclivity towards, right. or what I'm, I'm I'm leaning towards. And I'm gonna set a vision and develop that vision and then train to to act on it, then you're good. Then you're on your path. That would right. be your path, whatever that is. And you know, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's not a formula, it's just what you would yeah. do. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, you just basically described, you know, magic manifestation or conscious manifestation. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Again, vibrate, do things to allow you to maintain a high vibration. You attract other like vibrating beings into your life. You then yeah. talk, you communicate, as you said, you effectively frame questions. You don't get argumentative. And then from the questions you create, consciously responsible, focused intent, you know, products or solutions, whatever they are, that will build, as you said, the better earth or the new earth or the new now, world. Now, to your point, the way this happens, and this has been proven in, in history, so this is not some like divine revelation. Things happen in three, six, and nines, and twelves, but mostly in threes. So let's say you have a group of peers and there's 12 of you, well, then you would, you would ideally, you would, you, you would set an intention or a goal that you're going to build a community center, as an example. Three of, and then you branch out into threes, and three of you are going to go work on the building materials, and three of you are going to work on the outreach program, and three of you are going to work on, um, on, in, on engagement and, and managing um, the relationships, and three of you are going to handle operations, uh, financial operations. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. And... And, and if you can do that, and it's not, you know, it's not impossible, obviously, you know, you can make real change. People typically just don't, don't do those things. They just don't do it, you know? No, no. It's, no, um, no. So. All right, yeah. so before I let you go, and again, it's an opinion question. Where are we going from here? Again, it's February 13th. So what do you, what do you foresee from a timeline? Standpoint? Hey, buddy, buddy, come on. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, it makes the podcast that much better. But uh, so we're in 2020. We're in the middle of February. Where do you see the next three to five years going? Mm -hmm. You know, and again, it's just a prediction. It's an opinion question. There's no well, that's right a question. Answer. But what? Well, what do you? I mean, what do you? What do you foresee happening in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. there's a couple different layers. Um, the first thing that is happening is we are transitioning out of what we thought was the democratic system. And we are, going, we are returning to a system of essentially um, techno monarchs who own assets and are privatizing everything because government is breaking down. This has good implications and bad implications. I would say ultimately good, uh, simply because these are the people that actually can make shit happen right now when governments are insolvent, as they are. And, and so just imagine, and this is actually already happening. Towns are being bought up by these right. types of people. Right. And, they're, and they're rebuilding. And they're rebuilding a lot of them with good intentions, frankly. It's not just a new world order thing. They really are. So there, there will be a diverse plurality of, of techno monarchs owning these areas, local towns, uh, parts of cities, regions, and building around that. And we're gonna see a, an array of different types of developments associated with it, which again, ultimately will, will be very diverse because governments are totally in that. So do you, see, do you see, again, opinion question, but do you see the USA dissolving before 2025? I don't see the USA dissolving I, I see that the federal government will be totally restructured and that states will actually come to the fore That's and, become, yeah. and become more autonomous. 
Um, it, it wouldn't be a secession of sorts, but it would be more like um, just states' rights would be reinforced. So almost like the United States would literally be various parts. There would like probably be an eastern, a southwestern, or something like that. But That's they would, it would be breaking all. It would, they wouldn't be broken as as a as a united group. The United States of the of the American Republic, something yeah. akin to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now. That's yeah, that's right. And it, and if you look at states like California, um, which are basically three different states in yeah. one, but they've been trying to secede for years. Forever, yeah. And and, yeah. and, and not the, the logic behind that is actually not flawed, right. um, even though we know what caused all of it. But right. um, New York is in a similar boat. Florida's in a similar boat where I live now. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen. I think that's a good thing. And I, I would also say that there's global parity because most governments are going undergoing the same deal. They, all governments, the way they're set up now, I don't care if it's a Western or an Eastern oligarchy or whatever it is, state is capitalism, uh, communal capitalism, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. They all suffer the same fate because they're too big yeah. and, they're, and they're dysfunctional. So final, so I, qu final question for you though on that, on that yeah. is the economic yeah. system. And again, you're more qualified to answer this than anyone. The economic system, what happens? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna go through a 10 year downturn unwinding the current system. And really all that means ultimately is unwinding all the toxic debt stacks that are out there. We're not gonna be able to um, write them down and there's different reasons for that because a right. lot of that, that is used and reinvested for things. There's too many tethers. You can't buy nothing with nothing, bro. You can't buy nothing with nothing. And you can't spend your way out of nothing. So that's an interesting concept as well. But, um, <laughs> but here's what's going on there. It's a really good question, Jay, which ties in. So I'm gonna try to give you the abridged version. There's over 48 countries now that are implementing a version of what I would call sovereign crypto fiat, which is basically a digital currency. Right. And um, it's not really cryptocurrency, but who cares? It's they're trying to basically put together a hand basket of currencies, um, and and that's basically to handle large infrastructure development. Again, right. not a bad idea. And, and in that scenario, the central banks, even though we know their origins, would actually act as the arbiters for the clearing houses for large infrastructure investment, which is fine because everything would be ledgered. The middle layer is more akin to what I just mentioned around the states and the regional development where you would have what are called complementary cryptocurrencies. If you know about uh, complementary currencies, Bernard Lyotard, who was, a, in my opinion, one of the greatest economists of our time, co-architected co the EU, developed 196 experiments around the world around complementary currencies. Apply that to crypto, and you basically have lo local and regional development where the currencies are tied to real assets, farming assets, land subsidies, energy subsidies, whatnot, and you have that. And then the third leg of the stool would be something like Bitcoin, although it won't be Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin is going to get uh, implode for different reasons, but where you would have essentially a, um, a stable type currency collateralizing all the other activity it would be the third, kind of like a gold standard. We can't go back on a gold standard technically for different reasons, but it would be something like that. So between those three, that would be the emerging financial system. Um, and in fact, we, the report's on our website. You can read, we, we, we wrote a report about this, um, but that's essentially what will happen. So we're, we're gonna be fine. What, what I would implore people to do is not own any debt. If you own property, own it outright, pay cash, right. get into precious metals, palladium, copper, silver, um, and hold on to them. Some cryptos hold on but just no one to pull the trigger. Just get into fungible and hard assets where you don't have any debt, a debt attached to it and you should be fine for now. So do you think holding on to cash is a bad move? Or I mean, is it, is it too unpredictable to know what No, holding on to cash is fine. I would just make that about 20% of your portfolio of assets. Yeah. 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 Well, you wouldn't hold any stocks or equities at all, correct? Hell no. I'm out, I'm 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 currently out of the equities markets just because I don't want to deal with the headache of. I mean, I've been out of the equities markets, and again, I'm a guy who made a lot of money. I mean, I would know what to do. I mean, I you know I could probably make a lot of money doing it, but I I just I don't yeah, it's such it. a manipulation. Well, I mean, I I am I've been open about this. I you know we do have self-directed both Monica and myself 401ks, and of course you have to put them in something. 
you know, how the game I would, is. I would, because, you know, there's a $30 tr trillion dollar pension hole. Yeah, and right. I know. Um, no, it's insane. I don't think people realize. So all the entitlements that are uh, attached to the government, including 401k plans, are going to get wiped out. Most people are going to be zeroed out. I think, we, I think, I think we know that. It's just a matter of when. Pensions are actually already wiped out, which is terrible. It's disgusting that, you know, people that are in civil, civil service to us um, yeah. don't even have their retirement benefits. Yeah. That, it's insane. So yeah. Wall Street already gambled away that, that away at the casino. But, um, yeah, I would get out of all the traditional asset classes. And if you look at performance in those asset classes, save for maybe ETF and ETF arbitrage, index trading, which are – which you might yield an eight to 12% return annually, not, nothing at passive income in real estate, as you know, uh, yeah. in, income that's down to two to 3% max. Nothing. I mean, I know a lot of people are getting out of those deals. They're buying up properties just to sit on the, on the valuation speculatively. Right. Yeah. It's speculative. Yeah. yeah. And rental market will go up of course, but you got it. You just got to own everything outright. And, and the only thing know. is with land, you know, it's always been the theory that, you know, the supply and demand where there's a higher population, it's going to grow. And so you would think that Southern California and places like that, the desert Southwest would still grow because again, the climate's good and yeah. you do have an influx of people, but now with the whole thing with coronavirus and stuff, you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. and there's always the possibility of, you know, something calamitous happened, which we won't talk about, you know, cause again, acts of God, whatever, but uh, dude, this podcast has been so profound, man. How can people connect with you? Um, online or if they want to reach out to you from yeah, I'm, I'm, um, as you know I'm the only social media I'm on still is LinkedIn for my network my yeah. business network um, yeah. so I'm there and I post uh, infrequently there um, I have a medium blog where I post infrequently but a lot of my work is there and then my website novena.tech and the research section um, there's a lot of reports which you can download for free which talk about all, a lot of the things we addressed today. Awesome, so. dude. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll make sure I put a link to your medium article on self-love, responsibility, and providence. Oh, yeah. Amazing, okay. amazing article. Man, Gunther, man, I love you, brother. I'm, I'm so glad that we got a chance to catch up here today. Thank you so um, much. You know, and to all the audience and the, and the listening audience and everybody who follows me, remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. I will see you guys in the future.